Hello and welcome to the TMC Newsroom. Uh, Rich Tarani here. Thanks for watching. We're at our Norwalk, Connecticut headquarters today and uh, on our program is Mike Mitch. He is the VP of Enterprise Technology Unit of the Information Technology Group of uh, NEC. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rich. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, likewise, I thought our viewers would benefit from getting a sense of how uh, the Information Technology Group and communications um, coexist and maybe a little history about uh, NEC. Oh, that'd be great. Um, NEC's uh, founding father, so to speak, started with uh, telecommunications. Uh, the company has a rich heritage in communications, being the first um, joint venture with an American company, Western Electric, founded on telephony products back in 1899. So the company has a long history in the communications side. Uh, in the, um, the mid-50s, 60s, uh, the company embraced computer technology and came up with a theme of what we call CNC, uh, computers and communication. Uh, the computer, computing platform technology uh, empowering, so to speak, the communication technology. And now what you see in the industry where a lot of the communication technology is running virtualized, actually running on top of the computing infrastructure, the IT infrastructure. That's the side of the house that um, I represent for NEC Corporation of America here in North America. Fantastic. Now, um, there's some commonality as well, right, between the uh, information technology and the communication side, like things like cloud. I'm, I'm curious if you could go into that a little bit. That's a great question. Um, yeah, the cloud um, movement, so to speak, here in North America, which on an overall basis we see that as being more progressive here in North America than some of the other markets, um, is a great common platform for both the telecommunication technology as well as the IT infrastructure, uh, primarily in the terms of um, virtualization. A lot of the communication technology that you had in the past um, where you had purpose-built uh, PBX type of devices for telephony have now worked their way into software, which now are software components that run on top of an IT infrastructure stack. Uh, cloud technology or cloud delivery of that is another channel delivery of that, so to speak. So NEC is well positioned in delivering the infrastructure from computers, storage, and networking through to the software that allows cloud computing to be realized here in North America. So uh, from a customer standpoint, uh, why do they choose NEC as a partner for their communications and or their information technology? That's a, another great question. Uh, here in North America, we've had a rich heritage of uh, telephony technology, whether it be in the um, healthcare space or in the hospitality area. Those are two markets that we have very strong positions in, um, where they've got uh, traditional PBX systems. And they're looking for a company to consult with to decide, you know, what is the best way for them to migrate to the cloud type of an environment. Um, coming at it from not only the uh, software technology offering a seamless migration from uh, PBX type of technology or older technology into a cloud type of environment, whether it be on-prem or off-premises, but running on top of an NEC, what we call N-block architecture, computers, communication, networking, as well as the storage. That allows them to have a choice on whether or not they want to have an on-premise solution or have a hybrid cloud type of a solution for off-premise. So um, a lot of our existing customers coming to us consulting, looking for choice, whether it be on-prem or off-prem, um, as well as companies that are looking, for their, looking at the uh, cloud computing space and saying, who can provide me you know, a single one throat to choke, so to speak, right? A total solution, whether it be from the, uh, you know, the infrastructure up to an application tier, all the way to applications as a service, um, such as our telephony solution uh, with SphereCall. So uh, it's a very broad based, whether taking care of the existing customer base or bringing new customers that are looking for one throat to choke, one vendor to be able to provide a total solution. Now, um, in terms of your, you mentioned uh, channel, but I wanted to maybe use a different uh, meaning for the word channel that I, I want to um, get at, and that is, uh, do you sell mostly direct? Do you sell direct and channel? I was just hoping you could shine some light on, on how you go to market. It's a great question. Um, most of our business is channel-based. What I mean by channel-based is through partners. Partners are what started NEC in North America 30, 35 years ago, whether it be in the telephony side or in the computing side. And we're very strong in working with those channels and maintaining those channel relationships. So the channels on the indirect basis are very, very important to us. Cloud is somewhat of a interesting, some people perceive it as a disruptive technology as it pertains to the channel, but we've adopted a very channel-friendly approach to ensure that cloud computing and cloud technology can be embraced by the channel, right, so that they can move into that area and deliver those services um, either with our support or without their support. So we have a kind of a with, to, and through model that allows us to work with the channel based off of our cloud solution. 
And so for uh, channel partners, is it a recurring revenue model instead of a one-time commission on a piece of hardware? It's now an ongoing? Absolutely. Yeah, we feel that that residual value is very, very important. It's not a one-time transaction. As the, the cloud model um, evolves, the way our vision of that is, is that it moves from what was traditionally a CapEx environment over to an OpEx environment. In the OpEx environment, that monthly recurring fee is very important. And the delivery of the service is also much more important. So that one-time transaction um, has much more residual value. And it's very important to us to make sure that the partners are fully committed to maintaining that value through the sales cycle and through the life of the operational aspects of the system and the solution. So uh, if you look at the economy over the last, uh, let's say, 10, 11 years, it's been kind of uh, this up and down, choppy sort of uh, few months on, few months off, uh, some concern, uh, some euphoria, some con concern. I've seen bits, of, bits and pieces of all of it, but literally changing, going up and down. Like you know, I haven't seen that in the prior decade. The 90s seemed to be a slower up and down cycle. So if you consider this to be a new normal environment where budgets are tighter, people are more concerned about ROI, what is the reason for them to be investing now in new technology and new communications? I mean, give us some of the, some of the benefits that uh, companies are seeing and maybe some of the reasons why people are investing today so that other people who are on the fence and they need to go into a board or they need to tell their CFO that they need to spend money, get, kind of, I guess, arm them with the information they need to, to make the case for uh, investing in technology? Good question. Well, as a technology provider, obviously we want to make sure that we're bringing technology that's differentiated, that provides the ROI to build that case. Um, but I would say, looking back over the last couple of years, like the cycles you're talking about, you know, two, um, two discussions are taking place in that boardroom area. One is, how do I release this capital cost that I have, right? And the, uh, the maintenance and all the, the costs that are taking to keep and support that capital cost that I have in place. So being able to have a solution in place that allows you to address that um, in a uh, hybrid or in a private cloud environment is one of the model areas that we see, and we'll talk about that in a second. The other area is in the delivery of service. What we see occurring with the internet and with um, the hosting firms that are out there that are going to either to a private cloud or a multi-tenant is that they're struggling in to ensure that they've got the bandwidth that they're paying for at the time that they want to pay for it, much like what you find in the electric utility model today where you know billing takes place over the course of a day, you know, a 24-hour cycle, and you have different time periods that you're actually paying for the electricity. Well, you can't do that with today's networking infrastructure. However, um, in the afternoon, in the evenings, when the news is on, people want to be able to get those video feeds. They want to get those video feeds free of any choppiness, right, without any interruption of service. Sure. So being able to bring technology like the uh, programmable flow technology from NEC, which allows us to guarantee that latency, it allows us to guarantee the bandwidth right to those endpoints. Um, and it can be monitored and metered <laughs> and turned into a service. Uh, firms like NTT communication now are offering, based off that technology, SLAs that guarantee that level of quality where in the past you couldn't. So um, it, it was very unpredictable and you had a kind of a best effort or you went back and forth with your hosting company trying to get to that point. So from a carrier standpoint, you can actually generate additional revenue. And from an end user standpoint, if you're a corporate end user, you are able to ensure that certain, uh, certain people within your organization have the... Uh, they have the bandwidth necessary for the applications that they're running. It could be a trading application. It could be a CRM application. It really could be anything. It could, could be, be an archiving system. Call that center. Echo call center. It could be any of those types of things. You know, depending upon what it is, what's most important, right, for the application tier um, at the time of the business. I mean, one of the things that I think that the risk officer inside of the organization, um, the CIO, has been, had a challenge in is being able to say, I can guarantee this level of service delivery across my organization for that application. Sure. Right. And I want to ensure that amount of bandwidth is being and allocated for that application because that's my core business. Sure. So being able to get to that level, that's been a real challenge. And this type of technology with programmable flow really enables that. Uh, being able to look at it from a, commu a computer standpoint because the open flow technology or programmable flow from NEC uh, utilize uh, software defined networking. Right, which utilizes a server to look at all of the flows across all the entire fabric that's within the data center as well as outside. And when you can do that, then you can get in a holistic view of what your flows are, what your um, SLAs are for the flows, and you can prioritize that. That's never been available in the industry before. So being able to deliver that, whether it be to the, the private enterprise or to the carriers um, or to the, you know, the public health environment, uh, that's a very, very breakthrough kind of technology that allows you to go upstream 
right, being able to differentiate yourself um, at the board level. Right, say, I need to be able to do this. Uh, so that's kind of on the technology side. Back to your original question. The other area um, is on that operational space. How do I get, how do I take this capital cost that I have and how do I turn that into an asset for the corporation? Well, one of the areas that we see, um, and we've worked very closely in the hosting business, is to partner with strategic partners um, that can deliver the, not only the private cloud, the hosting space, but also the utility of the server, the networking, and the storage as a part of that monthly fee. Right, relinquish that um, capital cost that would traditionally have been tied up in buying all of that storage, all of that, and turning that into a monthly fee. So that's the other area that we see a lot of discussion is going on, where um, the, the CFO is looking at how do I make significant changes inside my organization? What company is going to stand behind that platform and give me an SLA along those lines? So that's the other area that we've worked very, very closely with our partners and um, our Cloud and Vault offering is one of the areas to deliver that type of service. So um, I know your, your company on the communication side is strong in hospitality. Uh, just this week, uh, it was announced that the parent company of uh, Sofitel Hotels, I can't remember the name of the company, but they announced that their Wi-Fi is going to be free in all their hotels. So it seems to be this trend towards free Wi-Fi in hotels. And one of the concerns I have about that is that Wi-Fi speeds are going to slow dramatically in business users. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when everyone can get on the network and bring in, um, you know, we, we've got three, four, or five devices, some of us, and, you know, we got video on this one and audio on that one. Point is, business users are probably going to want a different class of service and they're going to want to pay something and, and hotels are likely going to want to make that money. Is that an area that, that you're currently playing in or have considered at all? Um, well, indirectly, yes. So one of the areas for our carrier group, right, is our Pazio Link, our um, microwave and our WiveMax technology that we sell to the carriers, right, that provide that um, 4G, right? So I, what you'll start to see, I mean, I even today, I, I go to a hotel, I'll check in the hotel, they have free Wi-Fi. I still turn on my 4G hotspot. <laughs> right? Most of the and times I'm finding it's faster. It, yeah, it's, there's no 4G. question. You know, and I don't want that. 12.95 or 15.95, though, you'll find that, that often that can be faster than your, your 4G, I found. Uh, when you're paying if you're that. paying like $15 a day or $12 a day, a lot of times I found the hotel Wi-Fi would be faster than the 4G. Depends. Pay enough. You know, it it, de it depends. It really does. I've not I have not personally noticed where you're making the payment. It's just once you get under the Wi-Fi, it's okay. Is the Wi-Fi stable? Is it connected? Do I have the bandwidth? Right. Luckily, I'm and I'm looking for that instant you know connectivity. So I'm become a lot more dependent. But I guess the reason I bring that up is that while Wi-Fi is now becoming a commodity, right? I mean, essentially, it's sure. becoming a commodity to lower level. Even that technology, 4G hotspots, right, next generation beyond that will still continue. So I think that it will be a challenge to some extent for the, um, uh, the, the uh, hotel, so to speak, right, to be able to say, okay, what's going to be my next generation? Is it still going to be the plug? I mean, you know, one of the things that's getting kind of interesting is I still look, when I'm in a really bad area, you know, I'll still look for the cable, <laughs> all right? And I still go for the cable. And in certain instances, I'm willing to pay for that, right, for that guaranteed, sure. that guaranteed bandwidth as, as long as I could get it. Thanks so much for your time today. This was great. Hi, Richard. It was a great talking to you, sir.